Happy Sabbath, brothers and sisters, and welcome to our sacrament service today, which is the, let's have a look, it's the 7th of the 9th, 9th uh, 2024, and we're at Carl's home, and I'd like to ask Carl to say an opening prayer, if he can. First of all, brothers and sisters, I'd just like to say how nice it is to be back with Mother with brother Michael after my short absence and I will say open and pray. Heavenly Father, King of the Universe, we thank thee so much for the blessings we have. We ask thy blessings upon all our brothers and sisters that they may find peace and happiness in this world, that they may come together as one family, one family in Christ, that they may bring blessings to others that they may speak to or come across in their daily lives. And I say this in the name of our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. Thank you for that blessing, Kyle. And hopefully you've got your emblems ready and your water or wine. At this time, we welcome all present to Christ's table. We invite all who would participate to do so as an expression of the peace and love of Jesus Christ, in whose name we worship. The Lord's Supper is a sacrament, a time to focus on the life, death, and resurrection of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. As disciples of Christ, we renew our covenants and recommit together to His mission, to grow closer to Jesus Christ as individuals and as a community, worshipping Jesus Christ through God's Word, the sacraments, ministry, outreach, Kabbalah, and Jubilee. We encourage all that are worthy to receive communion to do so frequently and devoutly. Uh, we're going to say the prayer, so if you'd like to bow or kneel, whichever you prefer, Kyle is going to say the blessing on the bread. Then I will continue with the blessing on the wine or water. O oh God, the Eternal Father, we ask Thee, in the name of Thy Son, Jesus Christ, to bless and sanctify this bread to the souls of all those who partake of it, that they may eat in remembrance of the body of thy Son, and witness unto thee, O God the Eternal Father, that they are willing to take upon them the name of thy Son, and always remember him, and keep his commandments which he has given them, that they may always have his Spirit to be with them. Amen. Amen. We shall now go on to the blessing of the water or wine. So if you'd like to bow or kneel or whatever you prefer, we should do so now. O oh God, the Eternal Father, we ask thee in the name of thy Son, Jesus Christ, to bless and sanctify this water or wine to the souls of all those who drink of it, that they may do do it in remembrance of the blood of thy Son, which was shed for them, that they may witness unto thee, O God, the Eternal Father, that they do always remember him, that they may have his Spirit to be with them. Amen. Amen. Shalom, sure, brothers and sisters. This week I want to talk to you about hope. One of my favorite scriptures in the Book of Mormon is in Alma. It's Alma 16, 110, 31, 31a. O Lord, my heart is exceedingly sorrowful. Wilt thou comfort my soul in Christ? Last week, Michael talked to us about depression and he went over a number of different scriptures that can help us when we feel overwhelmed or we we get depressed unfortunately depression 
is a very common feeling problem in our modern community. I've heard some people say that depression wasn't really as big of a deal in the past because we were so busy trying to survive, we didn't have time to stop and realize that we were sad. I would argue that some of us are still trying so hard to survive that we don't have time to stop and recognize that we are sad, and yet we still find and make the time to do so. I want to talk about one of the things that overwhelms me, one of the things that makes me depressed. I'm not saying that this is the only reason or that what I'm going to say is why you're sad or why you hurt, but I am hoping that by sharing my own personal experience, it can help you to recognize when you feel low, when you feel sad. And although what works for me won't necessarily be what works for you, I'm hoping that it can give you hope that there is something that can and will work for you. One of the things that really causes me pain in this world is, to be perfectly blunt, the pain of this world. The reason why I love this scripture so much is because I completely understand what Alma is feeling. I completely understand what he's going through here. If we look up further in the, in the chapter, it talks about Alma and his friends going to the Zoramites. And when they get to their lands, they see that they build this thing called a Ramiumpton, which is interpreted as the holy stand. It's basically a platform, and they all get up and they say a similar prayer where they thank their God that they are the ones that are chosen. And they thank God for leading them away from the traditions of the other Nephites. Growing up in the Salt Lake City Church, this always reminded me of fast and testimony meeting. We would get up, we would all say the exact same thing. I know this church is true. I know the Book of Mormon is true. I know Joseph Smith is a prophet. I know this is the one true church upon the earth. And I'm so thankful that I was pulled out and set apart from the rest of the world to be given this truth. And it's so sad that everyone doesn't have this truth that we have. Now, I want to be very clear that I'm not saying this to slight the Salt Lake City Church. Because the reality is that this is what all churches do. I've been to Protestant churches, and I've heard them say, not the exact same words, but something very similar, particularly when they know that I'm there and that I'm Mormon. I'm so thankful that I have Jesus in my life, that I have the Word of God written in the Bible so, so that I can't be led astray. And it's so sad that other people think they worship Jesus, but they don't because they're, they don't have what we have here in this church. Brothers and sisters, this is the us versus them mentality. And it's the exact opposite of hope. Yes, it builds a community. Because everyone wants to be a part of the us and not one of the them. But it also creates a sense of loneliness. Because everyone there, or maybe not everyone there, I shouldn't say that. But a good number of the people there don't really feel like they should be there, like they belong. I can't tell you how many people in the church I grew up, I met and said, I'm not good enough. I don't fully believe everything that's being said. I disagree with things. So I'm, I'm one of them. I'm not one of us. Or maybe I'm one of them and not one of us. And that fear, that fear over faith that they don't belong. And this is exactly what happened with the Zoramites. They taught a prosperity gospel. Those that are truly accepted by God and loved by Him are rewarded with wealth. I do not personally believe that that is the gospel of Jesus Christ. I think it's about building a personal relationship between us and God and not our wealth or the accumulation of worldly goods. But that is what the Zoramites believed and it's what they taught. And I want to be very clear also that I still accept those that believe the prosperity gospel as my fellow Christians. They just have a different theology than I do because I refuse. I reject the us versus them mentality. 
if they come to Jesus and they have a different understanding of what that looks like and what that means, we're all still Christians. We just differ in our theologies. And that's okay. Now, I will be very clear, however, that the Book of Mormon is not okay with the prosperity gospel. Alma prays, saying, Lord, will you suffer that thy servants dwell here below in the flesh to such gross wickedness among the children of men? Behold, O God, they cry out unto thee, and yet their hearts are swallowed up in their pride. Behold, O God, they cry unto thee with their mouths, while they are puffed up even to greatness, with the vain things of the world. Behold, O oh my God, their costly apparel, and their ringlets, and their bracelets, and their ornaments of gold, and all their precious things, which they are ornamented with. And behold, their hearts are set upon them. And yet they cry unto thee and say, We thank thee, O God, for we are a chosen people unto thee, while others shall perish. And yet they say that thou hast made it known unto them, that there shall be no Christ. That's where it differs right there, obviously, because Christians believe that there is a Christ and the second coming is going to happen. O Lord God, how long will thou suffer such wickedness and iniquity among this people? O Lord, will thou give me strength that I may bear with mine infirmities? For I am infirm, and such wickedness among this people doth pain my soul. O oh Lord, my heart is exceedingly sorrowful. Wilt thou comfort my soul in Christ? And now we're back to the very verse that this message is based on. O oh Lord, wilt thou grant unto me that I may have strength, that I may suffer with patience these afflictions, which shall come upon me because of the iniquity of this people. O oh Lord, wilt thou comfort my soul and give unto me success? and also my fellow laborers who are with me. Yea, even all these wilt thou comfort, O Lord. Yea, wilt thou comfort their souls in Christ. Now, there's a couple things I want to talk about here. My issue isn't with people believing an incorrect theology. My problem is the suffering of those that bear the brunt of that theology. What does that mean? Growing up in the LDS church, I've confessed this before, and I'm going to confess it again right now. I was very homophobic. I'm not going to get into all the reasons why. They were very clear that homosexuality was a sin and that these were vile abominations. The way that they spoke, it was just as if they were not even people. And that's what I grew up with at school as well. That is a very normal American conservative Christian thing. And when I say conservative, I want to be clear here. I'm not talking politically. I'm talking theologically conservative. When I did a deep dive into the scriptures to try to prove this theology correct, I realized I couldn't do it. And so I took it to the Lord. I studied and I prayed to find truth. One question that I am asked sometimes when I'm looking into things is, if you discover through your research, through your studies, through your prayers, that what you believe is wrong, what will you do? And my answer is simple. I will change my mind. Study and prayer are a compass and a map. When they point me north, I'm going to correct my way. And brothers and sisters, that's what I did. And there were two pains. And when I say pains, I don't just mean spiritual pain. I don't just mean, I was, I was kind of sad. I mean, I physically hurt because of my sin. Because I knew that words that I had said had caused spiritual damage to other people. And I asked the Lord to forgive me and to comfort my soul in Christ. And to this day, what hurts me isn't the pridefulness of people. Because I'm sure I have my own pride. I know that I have my own sins. I'm not perfect. Nobody is. That's why we all need Jesus. But just as those standing up at that Ramiumpton, pushing this idea of superiority, knowing that I used to be one of those people, and looking down on those that I hurt, and seeing those that hurt still today, pains me in a very similar way to what Alma is crying here. When I recognized my sins, I felt a sense of hopelessness and despair. How many decades had I been alive and how many years had I spent pushing this 
path of pridefulness, this agenda of us versus them, and setting people to the side as if they didn't or don't matter. And so I took it to the Lord, and I repented of my sins. And I asked the Lord to comfort my soul in Christ. And even today, when I see how churches and individuals treat the LGBTQ community, it physically pains me. Because these are real people. These are children of God. And it's not just them. I am very opposed to racism. And I stated very clearly over and over again that if the, the ban on blacks, the ban on black men, and I apologize for speaking this way, but if black men would not have been allowed the priesthood, I always said that I would have rejected ordination. I never would have become a deacon. Why? Because we all came from Africa, and so each of us have a drop of black blood in us, as Brigham Young puts it. And so therefore, according to Brigham Young, no one's worthy of the priesthood, not even him. We are all one race. We are all one people. And therefore, to segregate out by race means that no one can be included. And when I discovered that I was wrong in my views of the LGBTQ community, this hopelessness came over me because I had to ask the question, okay, if that's what you would do if black men were not ordained, what will you do knowing that members of the LGBTQ community are not truly welcome? We can stand with our LGBTQ brothers and sisters and non-binary siblings and hurt for them and hurt with them because I do. And it's the same thing with the impoverished saints. Christians who suffer because the churches they go to tell them they're not good enough. They've got to, they don't have anything and they've got to give what little they have. And their churches are very unwilling to help because they think that they are lesser because they haven't been blessed with wealth because of their prosperity gospel. Yes, I accept them as fellow Christians, just as Alma accepted the Zoramites as fellow Nephites. But it still hurts seeing these people being cast to the side, treated like second-class citizens, and being told that they're not good enough. They're not worthy. They're not welcome. This, brothers and sisters, is where the bulk of my personal depression lies. In humanity's inhumanity to our fellow man. The words themselves don't hurt. What really hurts me is seeing those people that believe those words and seeing the pain that they are going through because they're not fully accepted by their faith communities. Now again, this is what weighs me down. This is what locks me into depression. I know it's not what locks everyone else down. It can be personal relationships. It can be things at work. It can be chemical imbalances. It can be a number of things. Brothers and sisters, I want you to know that what keeps me moving forward, what keeps me going, is this prayer. O oh Lord, my heart is exceedingly sorrowful. Wilt thou comfort my soul in Christ? Yea, even all these without comfort, O oh Lord. Yea, wilt thou comfort their souls in Christ? That is my prayer. And I say it often, sometimes daily. Sometimes I, I read people's personal experiences on social media and I have to just stop because the pain is overwhelming. I have to get down on my knees right there and ask God, how do we move forward? How do people hurt other people like this? Because the pain is overwhelming knowing that people treat other people like things rather than respect them as the human beings and the creations of God that they are. Please know that this is one of the purposes of the fellowship is to mourn with those that mourn. We love you. We're here for you. And it doesn't always have to be sad. When the good things happen, we rejoice with you. Brothers and sisters, 
I know it's hard. Not because I fully understand what you've gone through or what you are going through. But I know it's hard because I've gone through my own burdens, my own pains, my own regrets. I love you. I am here with you and I'm here for you. If you need to talk, I'm here to listen. I'm here to fellowship with you. I'm here to worship with you. I'm here to mourn with you and I'm here to rejoice with you. That is my covenant. Is the covenant I made when I joined the Church of Jesus Christ in Christian Fellowship. And I am not a perfect person, but I am striving to live up to that commitment. So I want you to know that you don't have to be alone in this. Whatever it is you're going through. Brothers and sisters, I don't tell you this because I want you to put your faith in me. I tell you this because I want you to put your faith in Christ. I want you to ask the Lord to comfort your soul in Christ. And I want you to know that I am with you asking the Lord to comfort your soul in Christ. And I want you to know that we are stronger together in Christ. We gain great strength individually in Christ. Don't ever doubt that. There are great things that we can do together in Christ. That is my message for hope for you this week. And I'll leave it with you in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. So that's our sacrament service finished. I want to apologize that I couldn't make it on to the, uh, to the prayer worship last week, but hopefully I should be back next week. I've had a bit of trouble with Virgin Media in our area as well, so that might not have helped. So don't forget, this Thursday, uh, 7.30 in the United Kingdom, I think it's about 2 or 3 in America, that we have our prayer meeting. If anybody wants to send any prayer requests, you can do so on the church's website or send them direct to me. Uh, I'm going to finish off with a prayer. So, Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time that we can come together and that your spirit is with us and we pray that you will be with us all week. Be with all those people that are suffering due to war, famine. All those people that have loved lost ones. All those people that are ill. Let them ask you to heal them and, and believe that it will happen. And it, it does. And all the things we want in our life, Lord. If, it's, if you want it for us, that it will come right for us. I say these things in your wonderful gift to us. Jesus Christ's name. Amen. Happy Sabbath, brothers and Happy sisters. Happy Sabbath. Peace be with you. Bye.